Welcome to our series, Masterminds, Lessons in Leadership. And I'm here with my co-host, Peter Lineman. Afternoon, Peter. How are you? Where we explore the intersection of strategy and leadership, which is at the crux of what we feel makes great companies great. And we are truly pleased and honored to have John Gray as our guest. Uh, John is regarded as probably one of the great leaders, if not the great leader, uh, in the real estate business, and he has now obviously been elevated beyond that. Uh, he and his colleagues have built probably the most formidable real estate organization in the world. And John, having been promoted now to president, COO, and a director of Blackstone, is arguably in the succession line to succeed Steve Schwartzman. So, John, thank you for joining us. We're honored and, uh, and privileged to have you as a friend and uh, really as a wonderful leadership example of what's, uh, what's going on in this industry. So uh, I do have one um, uh, quick fun fact that I'm going to ask you about before we start. Um, there are two great real estate leaders who were born and raised in Highland Park, Illinois. <laughs> uh, my guess is you can guess one of them. The question is whether you can guess the other one. Well, Sam grew up in Highland Park. I think, Bill and Peter, is that correct? That's number one. Yeah, he wasn't born there, but he grew up he there. He grew yes. up there. Right. Yeah. And you're the other. And I grew up in Highland Park as well. So it is. Uh, it was obviously a Bottle. good spot. Something in the water, guys. I just say bottle the water exactly. and sell it at Blackstone. That's the <laughs> All right, Peter. Well, if there's one lesson here, we don't ask John any questions because that are hard because he's going to get the answer every time. All the answers, right? Absolutely. So with that, uh, Peter, I'll turn it over to you. So, John, thank you for joining us. A great pleasure. Um, I go back to when Pete and Steve didn't have a real estate group. And I remember Pete Peterson uh, saying to me, should we have a real estate effort? And I, I, we talked about it and you know how it began. And in the early days, it was this small deal shop and it became what I would view as a strategy shop, much more than a deal shop. You wanna talk about that or am I completely off base? No, 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 that's a good spot. So Peter and Bill, thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be with both of you. I look forward to being back together physically. So going back in time, what I'd say is I joined Blackstone in the early 90s. I worked in the M&A and private equity area. And the real estate market had collapsed, as you guys all know, and it was just starting to come back. And Pete and Steve had this idea to go into real estate, and they found John Schreiber, another Chicagoan, to start the business. And I got tapped on the shoulder and they said, hey, do you, you know, we have some senior people, but we have nobody junior. Do you want to do this? Do a couple years, short tour of duty. And I said, sure. And that's how I got in the real estate business. And at the beginning, it was buying individual assets. I worked very closely with John Schreiber on $6 million shopping centers and $11 million hotels. And we were buying distress from banks and fin other financial institutions and insurance companies. And yeah, it was just buying things inexpensively, classic value-oriented real estate investing. And we rode that wave through most of the 90s, um, like others did. And then I'd say 9-11 came and that downturn. And I think really the tipping point, and we grew from very little capital at that point, maybe we had a billion dollars of capital. We noticed that interest rates had come down um, sharply and the commercial mortgage-backed securities market started to explode. And when we looked at public companies on the, on the screen, and Blackstone as a private equity firm obviously would often do what were then called LBOs, we said the real estate on the screen is much cheaper. Wouldn't it be interesting if we took this new debt, CMBS debt, that we could use a lot of in large quantum and brought it over to start buying public companies? And we started doing that in 2004 and five and six and seven, and the business started to supersize and ultimately got to Hilton Hotels and Equity Office with Sam, where we were doing 26 and $39 billion deals. And we were taking advantage at that point of what we saw as a real market inefficiency. 
And then I'd say the next step in this journey as we get to your strategic point, Peter, is the market collapses in the financial crisis. We're fortunate, we'd sold a bunch of real estate, we still had a lot of reserves in our funds, we liked what we owned, and we started going back into the market, buying all sorts of things. And really the tipping point was we began to identify that if there were themes that made sense, we should go all in and become high conviction investors. And part of that came from the Hilton experience, which is we bought this hotel company at the worst time in the world. Ultimately, we made $14 billion because it was a great company. We had a great leader in Chris Nassetta, and it was in a great sector, right? It had these brands, management franchise. And so we started looking for where could we deploy more capital in a high conviction way. And we stumbled on things like uh, global logistics, where we started out buying warehouses in the U.S. and then saw what was happening in e-commerce and grew that to $100 billion of assets today in that space. IT parks in India, single family housing in the U.S. and, and in places like Spain. And we started expanding more and more into obviously further into Europe, into Asia, into core plus real estate, into debt. And we started to think more and more about real estate, not as in the individual deal or the individual home, but more the neighborhood. And that these big thematic changes were happening in the global economy and that we should use our scale to really go after things, find great management teams, put capital behind them and generate excess returns. And the key behind everything, of course, is we've delivered for customers now for 30 plus years and we've delivered 15% net returns. And, you know, that success generates more capital and we've gotten to this enormous scale. And it's been done as a huge team sport with amazingly talented people. Ken Kaplan and Kathleen McCarthy are running the business today, doing an incredible job. But it has been an evolution. It did, to your point, Peter, start very small, one off has always been grounded by great analysis, but over time we've become more top-down, more thematic, and that really drove the business at scale. You know, it's, it's interesting, John, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said to me, you know, I want John Shriver's job, I mean, they have no idea how tireless and, and, and the hours that John put in to create what he created. Um, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling. Uh, for, uh, for and, and, and by the way, beyond just being a great investor and somebody who cared, he, he cared about the investment results, but he cared about the people. And he right. really wanted us to have a tremendous culture. And so he right. trained people not only in the art of investing, how to discount cash flows, how to think about risk factors, but also in the art of being good human beings, how to treat counterparties in the right way, and as a result, how to build a great organization. And too often in finance, people just focus on that first part. But to build a great enduring institution, you need both pieces. And that's really key, and John really had that. Yeah. How, how would you describe Blackstone's culture? I mean, you largely built it. You've meet, moved people all over the world. You've promoted from within. How, how would you describe Blackstone's culture? So I would say that there is it's, it's a culture of excellence. We're trying to be the best at what we do. And so we want to work harder than everybody else. We want to be as proactive as everybody else. We want to be the best, not just in deploying the capital, but in doing financial reporting, dealing with our investors, compliance. So excellence across the board and, and doing it in a way where you're always thinking about how can we accelerate? How can we do it bigger? How can we do it in another place? So we do this to the top standard possible and then think about what are adjacencies and other things we can do. So there's also this growth element. And then back to the people element, how can we do it with the highest standards in terms of how we operate, how we treat all of our counterparties, how we are stewards of communities. You know, if we own Stuyvesant Town in New York, how do we treat the tenants in the right way? How do we build the right solar project there in order to be better in terms of stewards of the planet? You know, you're really just trying to create something that is really unique and special. And I do think at the heart of it is great people who love working together. And I do think about it like a winning ball club where there's an immense sense of pride and where the teammates work together. And that takes a long time to build. And I will tell you, this year has been super challenging for us because you're so used to always being physically together. 
Being apart has been hard. And we've managed to do things like we created a Monday program for the entire firm called Blackstone TV, where I talk about what we're seeing around the world. Steve Schwarzman comments. We bring in various leaders. We have a photo contest. We're trying to connect people. We brought people back to the office earlier than other firms. We have testing and tracing. Um, we want to make sure we can get people together, obviously, on a voluntary basis safely. But the culture is so essential to a place like this. And so we invest enormous time and money into it. How is it different, John, running a group like real estate that had a, a target, if you will, versus running a firm? Um, is it different in terms of strategy? Is it different in terms of management style? Um, I've, I've never asked you that. I'm yeah. curious. It, it, it's different, but in a lot of ways, it's the same thing. I mean, the, the core mission for all our business units is to deliver great returns. They may do different things in infrastructure, private equity, private credit, hedge funds, life sciences, growth, secondaries. But the basic mission is the same. And how you do it in terms of bringing great people together, developing a great process, that's essentially the same. But what I've tried to do is, you know, for my day job, obviously, you can't be involved in exactly the same way, right? You're not involved in transactions. You sit on investment committees. You're, you're trying to provide strategic guidance, obviously, some individual deal guidance on things you like, don't like. But, but I would say the things that I've taken from the real estate group have been really important. So I talked about this thematic push in real estate. I've tried to push that at the firm level, which is what's happening in the world. What's happening is everything's moving online as a result of digitization. And so that shopping's going online, uh, dating's going online, medicine, content, software. And so be thematic about that as a firm and think about how we can invest in companies that may be software companies, they may be apps, or they may be compliance or supply chain related that benefit from that trend. You look at big things like the economy going green. And so let's not drill as many holes. Let's think about wind and water and solar and battery power and the infrastructure against that. Uh, we think about this revolution in life sciences, what's happening with um, big data and genomics coming together in precision medicine. And so how can we thematically invest in, yes, in real estate in the buildings, but in life sciences, we built a business that invests in phase three drugs. We invested in cold storage logistics and in private equity companies that bring these therapies to market and test them. So I would say the thematic approach that I had in real estate has been something I've tried to encourage more broadly. I'd say the team element we had in real estate, which is we started as a small group, and even though we moved around the globe and we were engaged in equity and debt, we really were small and tight, and we benefited from that informational edge, that data advantage. We've been trying to do that at the firm level, which is, wow, we have more data points than anybody. What we see in one part of the world can be very helpful for a different group. So try to have the teams work more closely together across business units. And then I would say this other idea of try to get everybody uh, to build this culture and invest as much time and try to have a whole firm-wide culture of people who are really connected to one another. Because people do this not just because they want to make money or have professional advancement. They want to be proud and they really want to do something where they like working together and they feel like they're part of a winning team. So I would say I learned a ton in real estate that I've been able to apply, and then I've, I've learned more in the new role. And so one of the things, as you can probably tell, is I genuinely love what I do. So it's all inclusive, it's all demanding, but I love it. I miss you know the real estate, but I get to spend plenty of time with a number of the senior folks, and I just love all these other areas where I get to spend time. So you've got to have a passion for it if you're trying to build something really enduring. John, let's talk a little bit about this issue of succession, because it's obviously top of mind for a lot of people. Um, you've got generational change, as you know, and you know, you've built a substantial business. And as then you were thinking about stepping up into a broader corporate role, talk a little bit about the skill set you were looking for to run real estate, obviously a much bigger business than what you inherited. Uh, you picked Ken and Kathleen. 
Um, did they have different skill sets, similar skill sets? And talk a little bit about the issue of having, you know, kind of co-managing partners running the business. So I, I would start on the succession side with what a great job Steve Schwartzman and Tony James did, which was to say to me, I don't know, five, seven years, whenever, before I even got the job, like, look, over time, you're going to get this. And at some point, probably three years before I even got anointed, six plus years ago now, to Tony brought me in into a bunch of the compensation related matters and other things sort of in the, in the back room of the firm, really to understand key conflicts, other issues. I had been put on the management committee and board, you know, a decade plus. And so they said, you're going to get this, but we want you to be trained. And they sort of let it out in a way so you didn't have one of these odd Game of Thrones where no one knows till the end and then they pull it out of the envelope and then the other person is embarrassed. What they did by sort of anointing me early was created a way for me to learn and no one else to feel that, that somehow they had been wronged or something. So if you wanted a case book study in succession, they deserve the credit for that. On my side, they did the same thing. Starting well before my thing, they said, look, John, if you want to and we want you to move up, you've got to start building your organization. And you've got to make sure that this organization can continue to flourish after you leave. So that led to me to elevate different people into different roles. Ultimately, Ken became the chief investment officer. Kathleen was the chief operating officer. And they had extraordinarily complementary skills because Ken had lived in the U.S. and in Europe, had run our European business, had spent a bunch of time in Asia a very experienced real estate investor, arguably as experienced as anybody in the world. Kathleen had come up, she had started as an investor when she came from Goldman, then worked on our investor relations side, knew all our clients, then oversaw all the things around people and technology and new businesses we were going into. And so they were de facto sort of running these things. And then they had amazing partners in Nadim Medji running the U.S. and James Sapala in Europe, Chris Hetty in Asia, Jonathan Pollock in our debt business. I could go on and on. So we had this great structure so that when I got elevated, the system just kept running. And they're definitely doing things better than I did, which is what should happen in a business. And they um, had worked as partners all along. And this worked seamlessly because they had the, one of the problems with co-heads is they're trying to kill each other off. They're both fighting over the same thing. But if you have a clear division of what each one does in this case, it can work really well. It also takes a certain type of person. And these are both good, self-effacing, hardworking, nice people. They both happen to be from New Jersey, suburban New Jersey, and they get along really well and they're friends. And that's made for a great partnership. And Nothing could make me prouder than the fact that they've continued to grow the business in an enormous way and the talent underneath them has continued to grow. So back to this idea of a long-term enduring institution as opposed to a business built around one individual, that's what the goal, they're really making that a reality and you build something that's like a well-oiled machine, which historically, as you guys know, in real estate or frankly any investment business, that hasn't been the mode. And that's really what we're trying to do, not just in real estate, but in each of our business units at Blackstone. And that, I think, is pretty different than most firms in this world over time. So, John, you know I'm very fond of young people, spent a lot of my life um, and continue with a lot of young people, the kids in Kenya, the kids here. Um, what advice would you have for someone as they are leaving university, either as an undergrad or grad, to your age, to that's following a professional career. I don't mean your position. What do you see they do wrong? What would you say? What do you say to yeah. them? I'm sure you say yeah. it to them. Well, you know, it's funny. These are the age of my children now. So um, they, they tend not to listen to me, as you guys know. Um, but, but what I would say is, um, first, find something you really enjoy and that you can be passionate about. Because if you don't like it, whatever it is, legal, medicine, teaching, finance, whatever it is, then you're not gonna be particularly good at it, I don't believe. Everybody I see who thrives enjoys what they do. The second thing I'd say is you wanna to go to a place 
that you can learn and also has a real culture of meritocracy. Because if I think about this firm and what Pete and Steve created was a place where people could really grow. So if you go to a place where you're learning a ton and you have the opportunity to move up and you're enjoying what you're doing, to me, that's a great combination. And then I would say, and I do say to young people, is don't be afraid to speak up. Too often people get these jobs, it's at a big firm, they're working on an investment, or they could be in the finance department and there's a certain report and they're, they think to themselves, wow, I could do this better, or this isn't a particularly good investment. And yet they're afraid to say that. And I, I'm always encouraging people to speak up because what you're looking for is not just to hire smart automatons, you're looking for somebody who has a new idea, who can make your business better and somehow serve your customer in a better way, generate more revenue, whatever it is, I would encourage them to speak up. And then I would encourage them to take some risks. So if there's an opportunity, if you look at my own career, you know, I was in private equity, I went into real estate, somebody would say, gosh, really? And I did it, you know, it seemed like a new interesting business and I happened to take a leap of faith. And who would have thought a guy like me with that background, a kid from Highland Park, who went into real estate could end up running, um, helping to run this amazing firm. And so I, I think taking some risk, sometimes you get an opportunity to move geographies within a country or across the world. And as part of that, you get incremental responsibility. So it's taking professional risk, personal risk by speaking out, but being in an environment where you can really grow, I think is essential. John, let me, let me ask you a question. I mean, you've, you've had a, a remarkably successful career by all accounts. If you could have done one thing differently uh, throughout your career, what would it have been? Um, you know, I, I, wish, um, I wish I had figured out this thing about really having high conviction and, and pushing even earlier in my career that when I saw things that I really believed, it took me a while and sometimes you need the benefits of age and things going wrong and that wisdom. I would say that, that focus that if you really believe something to go all in on it. And I, I think that um, for me has proven to be so essential as an investor. The other thing I'd say, and Bill, this resonates with you on, on the personnel side is so often we, we let things fester. Somebody's in the wrong job. They're not the right cultural fit. And somehow we think if we close our eyes or I don't know, something happens and yet the problems persist and we are hesitant to make changes because, you know, we're nice people. We want everyone to get along. And I would say I've learned over time that if something's really broken organizationally, you don't fully understand the ripple effect beneath it to the side. And almost every time we fix those problems, we look back and say, gosh, why did I wait this long to fix it? So from a personnel standpoint, it's hard to do, but addressing those things head on um, and doing it earlier. Another thing I've learned over my career, if I knew that then, I probably would have made some different choices earlier. So Peter, I think we've got an well, opportunity for one question each. What, why don't you, you know, go? Well, one question I like to ask people to wrap up, John, is um, what would your quote mom, I, mom, dad, whatever, if, if, uh, what would they be proudest of? No question. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, it, it, it does make me serious for a second. Can we, can we phone mom for a minute, see what she said? We could call my mom in, in Highland Park. So uh, she would say she's most proud of uh, the family I built with uh, Mindy and the four kids uh, we've raised. She'd say that. She'd say, yes, he's had good financial success. Great. I'm proud of his career but I'm most proud of him. And my father, uh, who's in Chicago also, uh, he would say exactly the same thing. I have no question about that. As hard as you work, that's, that's pretty darn cool, John, absolutely. Um, no question about it. Well, my last question is, is around this whole issue, as you can see above me, this issue of generosity. I know philanthropic uh, causes are very meaningful to you and Mindy. Just tell us a little bit about why they're so important to the two of you. 
Well, if you, you start with this basic idea that you've been given this extraordinary good fortune, um, something I never envisioned, certainly Mindy never envisioned, envisioned. She grew up in a pre-Civil War row house in Philadelphia. And, wow. and we find ourselves with, with um, this good fortune. And, and what you realize is you can do really good things with it, um, not just giving money, but impacting people's lives by getting actively involved, using your relationships, your resources, your expertise. And, um, and it can be something that can be a great mission to be on as well, because Mindy and I do this as a partnership. We were just talking with a cancer center doctor just before I came down here, and it's a real partnership, and it's a way to you know, get back to this work-life balance. How can you do something when you've got such a busy life? This partnership with my wife in this area has been really profound. And what we set out to do was we said, um, where can we give money? We found a great uh, executive director and our friend Dana Zucker, and we said, we can't boil the ocean. We've got to find some areas where we can really make a difference. We focused on low-income kids in New York City in the first case, because our children had every opportunity in the world, and there are kids who live a mile away who have a 6% chance of graduating from college. So how can we help them with education and health care and opportunity in a bunch of different ways across this city. So we spent a ton of time in that area. And then, unfortunately, Mindy lost her sister, Faith Basser, to a BRCA-related ovarian cancer. And we really said, going through that process, we need to create one hub to focus on this BRCA gene mutation because of the horrible impact it has on families who are impacted. And how can we accelerate the research and the treatment and potentially prevention over time. And so it's something we've spent enormous amount of time on as well. And so I think for us, we say um, we love this. We're able to have a positive impact. We like doing it together. And we recognize when the game's all over, nobody's going to write sort of, you know, in, in the on the tombstone or wherever, right, generated a good IRR or bought this building well. The, the memory, what, what did you leave behind is you were given this great good fortune. What did you do with it to have a positive impact on the world? And what kind of children did you leave behind? And so I try to remind myself of that every day, even though I'm working very hard, as you point out. Well, I think that's about a wrap, Peter. Do you want to close it up? But John, this has been spectacular. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best. We appreciate your, your time with us. You're the best, and uh, we know people are going to benefit a lot from this. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, John. Great to see you, buddy. Peter and Bill, great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.